there's still like this line and I understand why I get it. I mean, I've trained as an art historian myself, right? Like research, peer review, these are important things. You, you need markers and, you know, there's standards of course, but right. you know, it's art history. <laughs> it's not vaccine research. And I think that at the very least, we should be able to play with ideas and we should not be afraid of having people who are unqualified contribute to that conversation. And I do feel that, you know, if you turn on like Discovery Channel, whatever, there's always like mystery of, of the pharaohs, ancient aliens. And I think right. what all those shows tap into, or even these big immersive exhibits, like, you know, you're walking around inside Van Gogh's Starry Night, is that sense of awe and wonder that you get from great works of art. And so it upsets me when museums act as gatekeepers and they say, well, you can't think about the tapestries because you don't have a PhD. You can't play with these ideas because you don't know all the research. Well, you don't need to know the research. We're talking about unicorns. It's such a pleasure to have you here. You know, I've been so fascinated by the tapestries, but especially, you know, I, I, I sort of independently been fascinated by these tapestries, but then I read your story, I thought was really remarkable the way that you had, you'd sort of brought out the tapestries and also the story of this guard who I guess had looked after them for a long time. But can you tell us a little bit about the tapestries and how you got on to looking at them yourself? Well, I, as part of my job, had to learn everything about them and be able to not only absorb all the scholarly information about them, but then be able to translate them to the general public. And in order to become a full-fledged lecturer at the Cloisters, you had to sort of present an audition tour. And the Unicorn Tapestries was definitely the most challenging part. So a ton of reading and then a ton of thinking about how to explain them. And then 15 years of practice in the galleries with the general oh. public. Wow. But, you, but you saw them when you were a little girl, right? You saw them first? No, I never did. I you never saw them. You never first saw them. I saw them was in that movie, The Last Unicorn, that was like very popular with every woman who's now in their 30s and 40s. And yeah, I, I mean, I didn't you know there were a set of tapestries, but I never set foot into an art museum until I was 18 years old. So no. And here you are. <laughs> so how did you decide that you were going to be there? And then because, you know, it's quite challenging to learn all this, but how did you come to be there? And what did you think of the tapestries when you first started to explore them? And what are they exactly? Tell us for our audience, just tell yeah. us what they are. So the unicorn tapestries are a set of seven tapestries that are believed to have been woven around the year 1500 in France. And they depict a hunt for a unicorn. There's actually two sets of tapestries in the world that are sort of called the unicorn tapestries. There's the set in Paris at the Cluny Museum, and then the set that's at the Cloisters in New York, which I think are better. And they uh, both sets are equally mysterious. However, the only thing we really know about them is that they're the most elaborate set of tapestries in existence. They were an absolutely spectacular commission and undertaking and yet we have no idea who really made them and for what reason. Everything that is known about the unicorn tapestries in terms of the story that they tell and the time period is based on comparing them to other works of art. So the hunt for the unicorn and the iconography, you know, fits into certain religious themes and storytelling themes from around 1500. And then in terms of really the date of when they were made, it's fashion. All of the figures are wearing clothing that was the clothing of the French royal court right around 1500. Can I ask what made you become fascinated with them? You know, I don't know. They're just, I, I look at them and I just see a mystery, you know, a, a message from a long time ago. You know, I, I look at them and I, I try and think about the people who were looking at them themselves and trying to understand what well, was their dance going on in front of them. You know, I, there's so much left to the imagination and, and that's true of so many great works of art. I think this is a little earlier than Dante, but it's, it's, it sort of has some of the key characteristics of some of the people, you know, you look at Dante, you can't really know who all the people were because we don't know Florence at that time. So it, the, there's a lot in the poem that's left open to the imagination. And it just struck me as a very beautiful analogy of the same kind of thing. And, you know, I am partial to unicorns. So, you know, <laughs> it, it does catch one's imagination. Probably that little part of it is the same as it probably was then, you know? Absolutely. So do we think that they were actually in the royal court? They had to have been. The, those are the only people alive that could have afforded to commission such a set of tapestries. Yeah, absolutely. 
so what does the story denote, you know, panel to panel? Well, it depends on which order you're looking at them in. And, you know, of course, like the uh, way so we don't even really know what order they're in. Right. A of, yeah. A lot of educated guesses, you know, but the order that they're in the gallery present day has been debated in the past. And there are two tapestries that may not even have been designed to belong to, you know, the, the set of seven may be incomplete. We might have two wrong ones. Maybe there were 10 and we're missing a few as well. But we do see a distinct hunt for a unicorn. So sort of his discovery in front of a fountain by a group of hunters and then him running through the woods to evade capture being caught, being killed, and then being brought to a castle where he's presented to presumably the king and the queen. Now there's a lot of symbols in the in the tapestries themselves. So what are some of the symbols represent? Oh, well, there, how much time do you got? <laughs> this is, uh, and this is, you know, like the part of what makes them really fun and attractive and interesting. You know, you can get really like Da Vinci Code-ish with the tapestries, but the unicorn is a symbol of a lover male, the horn being exactly what you think it is. A phallus for the audience. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> the symbol of the unicorn itself also can be interpreted as an allegory of Christ. And so the hunt for the unicorn is the passion of Christ. There's absolutely just tons of significance in terms of, of the plants and the flowers because plants and flowers had spoke their own language, especially in a largely illiterate culture, though the royal court in which these would have been a part, certainly would have been literate. But nonetheless, it was an extremely visual culture. So even gestures and the position of hands and fingers, probably significant, but you know, we don't have like the decoder book or we don't have some sort of artist statement to say, this is what I intended to convey. The unicorn gets pierced. It's also in the beginning, doesn't it fight? And it's, it looks like it's actually piercing something else itself. Yeah, so the, the story of the legends of unicorns, and people did believe unicorns were real around the year 1500, they cannot be killed by conventional means. You can't shoot a bow and arrow and kill a unicorn. The only way he can be caught is to be trapped in an enclosed garden by a beautiful virgin maiden. So in the two scenes where the unicorn is sort of running away and evading capture, he is at one point sort of running over a stream to evade capture, and in another, he starts to fight, and he tears a basically a gash in the side of one of the hunting dogs and it's graphic and then also has a really interesting little detail in it of a rose which is something that I highlighted in the article as mm -hmm. sort of just one example out of many of something that seemed pretty significant but remained uninterpreted. And do we think one person made all the tapestries or was it multiple artists? How do we think it was constructed? We, we know this pretty well from how tapestries in general were made. And given that these are the most elaborate set that still exists today, we can assume that this workshop style was how they were, they were created. So first there would be sort of a court artist who would work in collaboration with the patron. So say, for example, it's the King of France, hypothetically, right? So his court artists, and there were probably several, but maybe one who was the lead, would sit there and create sketches. They would work with a theological advisor on creating the symbolism. And all of these things would be finalized as paintings, as oil paintings on board. And then the workshop assistants would then translate those paintings, you know, with all sorts of measuring devices into what were called cartoons, which are like giant patterns. So then they would be blown up to scale. So if they decided the tapestries are gonna be like, you know, 12 feet high, they'll translate those paintings. Then those cartoons, which are very valuable because you can make lots of tapestries from those cartoons, would get sent to a tapestry weaving workshop, which at that time, the best ones were primarily in Belgium, some in Northern France, and there'd be a tapestry broker involved. So it would be very, very expensive and you'd have to deal with the transportation as well. And then a group of tapestry weavers would sit down to work. So they would be implemented on these enormous looms with wool going up and down, what's called the warp and the weft. They usually had glass ceilings so that they could work by daylight. And with the cartoon usually underneath the loom, so visible through this warp and weft, they would not by not create the tapestries. And in a day's time, a very skilled weaver could create something about the size of the palm of your hand, so multiply this by all of the, uh, the surface area of the tapestries, which is to say a very long time and a ton of money because tapestry weavers were skilled workers and they didn't come cheap. 
So the French court um, disappears at a certain point. We don't know whether the tapestries appeared in the court or not. We just know that was most likely place that they would be. Where does, where does history take them after that? Well, we don't even have any record of them in the French court. That's, that's all just based on fashion. Where they really pick up in history, there's one record of them maybe from the 1650s in an inventory, but for sure during the French Revolution, when they are in the chateau of a royal French family, the Rochefoucauld, in 1793, their chateau is sacked and looted and set on fire and the looters steal the tapestries. And they're gone, they're missing for like 63, 65 years, something like that. And then a later generation of the same family says that you know they're trying to reclaim everything that was stolen. And the legend is, and I don't know if this is true, but I've said it many times on tours at the cloisters, is that a woman says, I have, my husband has some old curtains hanging in the barn. Perhaps you should have a look. And there they found the tapestries being used to wrap bales of root vegetables and being used to cover espaliered fruit trees in the wintertime. Question, question. How much do they weigh, you know, each one individually? And like, how big are they? Just to get the sense of if they were looted, you know, what we're talking about. Oh, I don't know how much they weigh, but they are made out of wool and silk and metal threads. So really heavy. <laughs> it, would take, it would take several large men to roll up one and move it. And yeah, they're about between 11 and 12 feet high. And, you know, the edges that are there now have all sort of been cleaned up by conservators. So they were maybe even bigger at the time. It's hard to say for sure. So they get found there, I guess, in Paris or somewhere in France. They get found there. They're there for, you know, over 100 years. And then all of a sudden they get sent to America. So Gabriel de la Rochefoucauld, who at, at this time, this is in 1922, he is a journalist and a well-known French figure. And there's a lot of outrage in the French press at this time about all these Americans buying all of France's cultural patrimony. You know, following World War I, of course, people in Europe are absolutely broke. And most of the money in the world is concentrated in Manhattan. And he wants to sell the tapestries because in one of the notes, he wanted to build a golf course. I also had to put some heavy renovation bills, which, you know, I'll give him credit. Restoring French Chateau does, is, is not inexpensive. So he very quietly comes up with a way to put them on sale. So he contacts this art dealer in Paris who's, who's got a, lot, a good reputation of selling antiques to Americans. And he says, they basically kind of come up with this idea that they're going to bring the tapestries to New York to kind of, you know, like educate the impoverished eyes of these idiot Americans. Right. Exhibition. It's not a sale, but it's going to be at a gallery where they sell things, but it's an exhibition. And this art gallery, this dealer, he contacts a man in the United States named George Gray Barnard, who at that time was a really famous artist. We don't really know his name so well today, but at that time he was known as the modern Michelangelo. And he carved lots of things that are on civic buildings around the United States, like big monumental sculptures that are on like Capitol buildings. And this guy, in addition to being a, a pretty spectacular artist, also had the very first version of the Cloisters Museum and was a big art dealer himself and an amazing storyteller. Like he could sell anything because he was such an amazing storyteller. So he, the art dealer in Paris contacts him because Barnard has a direct line to John D. Rockefeller Jr., who's pretty right. much the only guy in the world who can both appreciate them and afford them. Mm. Because the count in France will accept no less than one million American dollars. Right. In 1922. Like, that's a lot. lot. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't have the inflation calculator here right now, but that's a lot. That was back when a million dollars was really a million dollars. <laughs> yeah. They arranged for all this to happen. And there's, there's you know, of course, very carefully, um, and they pull it off. And, and the, it's very complicated because Barnard is actually in debt to Rockefeller. Rockefeller won't take his calls because he's <laughs> kind of sick of this pesky guy who's always trying to sell him stuff. But they managed to put it together. One of the, the best things was when I found the letter that Barnard actually wrote to Rockefeller like on a piece of hotel stationery, right. first introducing him to the unicorn tapestries. I actually like yelled a little bit. <laughs> What did it uh, say? Brian looked to hush, shush me right away, but it was to me it was so exciting to find it. And, what did it say? Uh, right, yeah, what does it say? Oh, I wish I should have pulled it up on my computer before I got on this call. But he says, "I've just seen the most rare and beautiful Gothic tapestries. 
There is nothing like them in Cluny or Versailles. They are veritable spring living in human figures. It's, it's very poetic as, as right. Barnard was. But, you know, he had this way of pitching things that really made people believe. And this was like, in some ways, he was a con artist. <laughs> but not really, he wasn't ever actually ever trying to fool somebody. He was actually somebody who would get so filled up with inspiration, like over the top but also be able to transmit that so that so many people almost felt like he was in touch with something else and they wanted a piece of that. So they were like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. I'll go there with you. Right. He really could take people there. So they wound up selling him the unicorn tapestries, but then there was a, a bunch of scandal because then it got exposed in the press and the French public went crazy and the French newspapers went crazy. And it took a little time for the dust to settle, but eventually they were put in Rockefeller's private home on 54th Street, which is the present site of the Museum of Modern Art. And right. they were there in, in just his personal possession for about 14 years, I believe, in his office. Nobody else saw them. So really, they were never seen by the public until 1938 when he donated them to the cloisters. So they existed from 1500 to 1938 with only having been seen by very few people ever. Questions, no. right? art history question. From that period of the time when they were ostensibly created, what are they doing for people? Like if a king commissions them, what are they doing? Are they telling a story that, you know, that, that king wants to be told? Like what's their purpose? Or, or in general, is it possible that they're meant to be seen with dance in front of them? Like, is that is that a subjective yeah. Yeah. idea? All of the above. We really put art in very tight silos now. You know, a painting hangs on a wall. It's decorative. You know, it's like secondary. These were pieces of propaganda. They kept the draft out of your dust, your dark, gloomy castle. They could be moved from your various, you know, castle to palace, to summer home, to winter home. They right. could serve as the backdrop for plays, for performances. They could form a corridor for a king who's making his entryway into a city. So certainly all of the symbolism that we can read into the tapestries, it would be really helpful to know exactly for whom they were created because then we would be able to tap into their propaganda. And all of these rulers, you know, they had poets and artists um, really, I mean, I think we need to think of them more like multimedia designers. They weren't just thinking yeah. about a static experience. They were really thinking about messaging and visuals and impact and impression at all times and for different kinds of audiences, depending on who might be seeing them. And what does the squirrel represent? <laughs> the squirrel was uh, also something I chose to highlight in the article because I, well, it's, it's a funny detail. There's one really major book written about the tapestries that was written and published in 1976. And that's really kind of the last word. I mean, there's, there have been articles since then, but this is the last major work. The curator who wrote the book just sort of focuses in on the squirrel to say, the squirrel may be significant or it may just be there to call attention to the tree. And I thought it was just like the perfect example of like an art historian who's being very authoritative about saying nothing. <laughs> we don't really know. We don't know. Well, I mean, but, but we, do that the, we do think that the face is a particular person, yeah? No, not of the squirrel, but what was read into it by Howie, the security guard who becomes the yes. subject. Now let's, now let's get yeah, to yeah, let's, yeah. Like yeah. We got to talk about Howie. You got to set us up for Howie, please. Yeah, so do you meet Howie when you're there? Do you Have you met him as a person? Well, I spent hours and hours and yeah. hours, many years of my life hanging out with Howie, absolutely. So let's set the, tell the audience who Howie is. So Howie is Howard Camo, who was a security guard at the Cloisters during the time that I was there. He was, he was there, I think, a total of about 25 years. And he came to the Cloisters in the 1990s after having been a Latin teacher for many years in sort of New York area, prestigious prep schools and Catholic schools. And, you know, he had lost his job many times because Latin programs were going by the wayside. And he got to a point where he just wanted a stable job and found a New York Times ad for a security guard position. And the security guards at the Cloisters, especially at that time, were a lot of older Irish men who had worked in the New York City subways. And this was like the easy retirement job. Hmm. And he you know, kind of grew up in that environment. So he got along with everybody very well. He had a great personality. He could kind of talk to anybody. But he never finished his PhD, but he almost did in classical philology and had been a Latin teacher and you know, knows 
everything about music, would go to the symphony every single evening that he had free, just an extremely intelligent and interested man. And so while standing around, you know, telling people where the bathroom was, he also became interested in the unicorn tapestries in particular. You know, he heard all the lecturers there giving their spiel a million times and he started to question where all the holes in the stories were and, and why everybody seemed to re be repeating the same things over and over again. And then he ends up going to the library on his day off and doing some research of his own and an obsession forms from there. So he studies the tapestries every day and, and looks for new insights. And then eventually he's going to France to try and find insights. I mean, when you meet him, are, are you expecting all that? Or are you, is it sort of surprising his level of obsession? And does he have to keep it from the people who run the, the museum? Like, how does it work? Well, at first he's trying to talk to everybody and is really surprised when the curators and the educators, what were then called the professional staff, just don't want to hear it, don't want to talk to him because he's not trained for this. And, you know, I, I mean, I think probably his enthusiasm, you know, and his persistence probably started to get on some people's nerves too. Right. You know, some of it was warranted. People are at the end of the day and he's there like, oh, let me tell you my, my rich theories and my ideas. When I started working there, my very first job was actually at the ticket desk. That was how I got my, you know, foot in the door. And at the end of the day was when he was coming onto his shift because he worked the night shift. And I was warned, don't talk to this guy. He's gonna, you're, you're fresh meat. He's going to chew your ear off, ignore him. And I, at that time, was really like trying to work my way up. So I just listened to people. I mean, I sort of did what I was told and kind of ignored him. But he he found a way to just kind of, you know, it has, he's, he's alive and well, a charming personality. He found a, a postcard in the gift shop of a, of a painting of a Madonna that kind of looked like me with the similar hair. And he pushes it across the desk where I'm standing and trying to ignore him and says, I found you in your past life. So he always found some way to engage you in a way that like, of course, you're going to start having a friendly conversation. And he did start to tell me about the unicorn tapestries. And he also was like an amazing salesperson. He could just kind of pick some tidbit that would hmm, get you interested. And it wasn't until like at least two or three years later, after I had been a lecturer and I was repeating myself, I was doing that thing of just like repeating the same old, same old boring scholarly information to the public, people asking me questions that I couldn't answer. And then I finally said, you know, screw it. I'm going to talk to Howie. But I had to, I had to really kind of do so in secret because a lot of people, you know, would have definitely frowned upon that. So it just strikes me, this is the crux of, of so many issues and, and, and things. Jesse and I, you know, once a long time ago did something with John Baldessari about who can go to a museum, what is art for. All of those things that you're talking about, I feel like they all come crashing in with your story and the article that you wrote, this idea that he's getting this incredible joy and, he, and it's, well, it's off track a little bit. You know, how do we promote more of that not being afraid to look at art or what is art? I mean, it raises all those questions and, and how do we get people more excited about going to a museum? But that's a different story. But anyway, yeah. different thing. You know, did you- thoughts on that, but yeah, we can come back to that. <laughs> well, what if, I mean, did you always want to be a writer? No, I guess I wanted to be an artist. I was always been just a creative person in general. I guess when I was a kid, I drew a lot. I was a graphic design major actually in, in undergrad. And then I just fell in love with art history, you know, in the ways that you do when you fall in love with something impractical and ran away with it. And the mystery of the tapestries, did that pique your interest enough that you wanted to write about it? Because normally you write about food and different things. So did this just grab you, this story? Well, you know, I, I wrote about a lot of other things while I was working at the Cloisters because to write about the things that I worked with, academic stuff was limited to academic writing. And academic writing is its own thing and it's only written for other academics. And I, and I tried to do that, but I wasn't successful at it because I bored myself. <laughs> and then uh, it took me a long time. It wasn't until after I left the Cloisters that I was able to write this story. I sort of felt I had enough creative freedom. It took me, there are so many drafts of that article. It's ridiculous. It honestly took me about 10 years to get it right. And does Howie, did he just stick in your mind? You know, was he just a man who was obsessing about this particular thing? Was there something about him that stood out that was tied into the mystery of the, of the tapestries themselves? It was that he was willing to play with all of these ideas and have fun with them and turn them around and discuss them. 
we, you know, we spent maybe half an hour every afternoon, again, the sort of the end of my work day and the beginning of his sort of tussling over these ideas. And sometimes I'd be like, you're crazy. That's not right. What are you talking about? I'm going to Google that and just tell you it's wrong. You, you know, that exchange was so much fun. And, you know, sometimes there were plenty of things that he said that I do and still think are ridiculous. And then other things he would say, where I go, you know, <laughs> that, yeah. How did nobody, how did I never think of that before? He, he just really pushed all of those boundaries. And then I knew from other, I mean, I was one of many people he was talking about. At that time, there was this diner, this like very old school, like greasy spoon diner that was sort of down the hill. The Cloisters is at the top of this hill in a park. And uh, he would go there early in the morning when he was done with his shift. And then like in the afternoon, the waiters and the waitresses and the fry cooks from there would come up to the cloisters because they're like, this guy keeps telling me about these tapestries and I got to see this squirrel that he's <laughs> telling me about. So he had, there were lots and lots of people that he did talk to. And, and most of the people that he engaged over the years, dozens of them had nothing to do with the world of our history. He did on some of his trips to France, he did have more success speaking to French curators. He speaks perfect French. And I think he says partially, maybe they were just impressed that, you know, this American could speak French as well as he could, but he said, you know, there were several where they went out for coffee and, and sat down and had really interesting conversations where at the very least they listened to him. They didn't just immediately dismiss him. But in all the years that he was there, he says he was never able to have a full conversation with the, the folks that he wanted to talk with. When the article came out, though, did the, did the curators see it? Was there any sort of acknowledgement or because you know, nothing Not to really to anybody. <laughs> Ian didn't acknowledge it either. No. Wow, that is really, that's what I'm saying about earlier. My question is, there's the, stu not stuffiness, but a little bit of that, you know, thing around art history and who gets to talk about art and all of that. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting because I feel like, you know, you know, and things are changing. Things are changing for sure. However, I feel like people sort of like overshoot. Like they'll do yoga in the galleries. Like I don't need you to go to a museum to do yoga. Like let's just talk. <laughs> like I'm, let's have a conversation. So I feel like there's still like this line, and I understand why. I get it. I mean, I've trained as an art historian myself, right? Like research, peer review, these are important things. You you need markers and, you know, there's standards, of course, but right. you know, it's art history. <laughs> it's not vaccine research. And I think that at the very least, we should be able to play with ideas and we should not be afraid of having people who are unqualified contribute to that conversation. And I do feel that, you know, if you turn on like Discovery Channel, whatever, there's always like mystery of, of the pharaohs, ancient aliens. Aliens. And I think right. what all those shows tap into, or even these big immersive exhibits, like, you know, you're walking around inside Van Gogh's Starry Night, is that sense of awe and wonder that you get from great works of art. And so it upsets me when museums act as gatekeepers and they say, well, you can't think about the tapestries because you don't have a PhD. You can't play with these ideas because you don't know all the research. Well, you don't need to know the research. We're talking about unicorns. We can play with the ideas without also changing the textbooks too. It's I just, I just feel that we just don't need yoga in the galleries. We just need more conversations. <laughs> you know, um, when Howie left, he moved. So did the obsession dissipate? You also talk about this, some of the health challenges he had. Did that all resolve itself? Yeah, and I don't even know how true some of them were. I mean, Howie was the kind of guy who like never had a phone. Uh, you know, he was just a single guy. I mean, he had family and, and, you know, certainly a responsible adult person, but he just wanted to do what he wanted to do, I think. And he was as interested and engaged with music as he was with art, probably even more so. Mm. So when he left the cloisters, I mean, it, that was at a period of time when I wasn't around there so much either. I was leaving and, and there were just all these rumors that spread and nobody really knew. And then he disappeared without any knowing for sure. And I, th I think sort of this, the secret heart of this piece is the security guard, Hank. That's not his real name, but he still works at the Cloisters and security guards are not allowed to have their real name published. And he was really Howie's best friend. And, and the, the whole piece of the essay, which means the most to me, 
is when he's talking about all of the antics that Howie would get up to in the evening when the museum was closed, playing music in the galleries, laying down in one of the chapels. Doing yoga, doing yoga. <laughs> but like letting, you know, he was experiencing on wonder in this, in this time when he lays down on the floor and he, he plays this beautiful piece of symphonic music and, you know, just experiences the space, like in a way that I think actually a lot of visitors would love to experience the yeah. space well, right? Just feel its beauty without needing to know that it's from 1200 and blah, blah, blah. And Hank was his willing kind of like accomplice. You know, it's like was, a night. It's like at the night at the museum, honestly. It's yeah. Sort of like that. And <laughs> I interviewed him about it. We, we went to another Gracie Spoon Diner in the Bronx and we spent, you know, many hours talking and I recorded the conversations. And there were so many times when he had tears in his eyes and I had tears in my eyes because he he said, he said, I didn't realize it at the time because it was just at work, but these were some of the most exciting conversations of my entire life. And, you know, Hank's like 20 years younger than Howie and you know, Hank's an immigrant from South America and Howie's this Irish guy from the Bronx. I mean, just like all of these pieces that never would have come together in any other environment and just were so interesting and unique. You make me ask, think of this whenever I go to the museum. I just am so fascinated with the security guards and the people that are working there. And, they, and it's a range of people and ages and ethnicity. There's, and they're so careful and protective of the space, at least in, you know, been to a lot of the museums in, in New York and in Los Angeles and in Europe and Paris and in Italy. Like, what do you think is that person that works there beyond a different person than a curator or someone like yourself who's a very, you know, an academic or writer, who are the people that come and do that job? Well, you know, a lot of them are people that I want to say, and so uh, many of us joked that they were the smartest people in the museum because they were the only ones with a union. <laughs> and, you know, like their vacation days rolled over unlike the curators and I think probably at the senior level some of them probably got paid better than curators. You know, so it's a mixed bag. I mean, sometimes they were just a simple blue collar job that doesn't require a lot of training. A lot of them were artists. A lot of them are people that were just looking for really easy jobs so that they could pursue art or music or whatever. No email to answer, just a, a pretty straightforward job, which I think is harder and harder to come by. Sometimes it's people just at a school that are hoping to make it in the museum world. It, it does happen, but that is not an easy path because people do get siloed into being, you know, in the, the blue collar part of the museum. It's always something I hope changes. I mean, there's a few people where that have crossed those boundaries. So it's really quite a mix, but you know, they gain a lot of affection for the place where I really think that curators and educators need to pay more attention to them is they just know what everybody's asking and exactly. they everybody's reactions. And that was how he's saying he was watching the yep. lecturers talk about the tapestries and, blah, 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 and then people being like, wow, and what about this? And what about that? And just watching their eyes open and, you know, thirsting for more and then just kind of being met with a, you know, a thud of, nah, I don't know. We don't know. No scholarly literature on that. Sorry. You know, we, we live at a time where we look at pictures or movies or anything and we're we're always trying to decipher the, the meaning as if there is a definitive definition. You know, isn't it possible that the creator of the tapestries wanted there to be a mystery, you know, so that the, the mind could fill in whatever the questions were? You know, it definitely seems it has a, some connection to the Arthurian legends, yeah, but, but not definitively necessarily, but, but uh, the mind can f do a lot of the work and maybe the answers don't matter as much as just the questioning. Yeah, and their minds worked in a very different way than ours do. I mean, this is before the scientific method. This is before the enlightenment. This is a world in which religious metaphors worked as political propaganda. For them, it was truth, not fact. They didn't really understand a fact as we understand it today. I, I like to say like the world was like this giant rubber band ball and to explain a concept or an idea, it's like you can pluck at each one of them and, and talk about them individually and all of these swirling ideas could come together. And in something like the tapestries, if they were presented to a royal audience, picking apart these clues and these puzzles was a form of flattering your intellect or the intellect of the king or the queen. They were really opportunities for discussion. You know, we're so accustomed to having images jump up and move around for us that our imaginations, you know, I, I don't know the neuroscience on this, but I'm sure that it, it exists. Somebody who understood this could explain it better than I. Their minds moved pictures that were still in a way that ours 
have probably become too lazy to do. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's quite wonderful. You know, really appreciate you spending some time with us today, Danielle, to talk about this. These tapestries have really been on my mind. So, you know, thank you. For those who want to kind of look, who maybe can't get to the museum, where can we look to look at the past, to look at them a little bit more in depth online? And where, where should people go? They have beautiful images on the Met Museum, metmuseum.org, I believe it is, the Metropolitan okay. Museum Awards website. Yeah, and they, you can zoom in and look more closely. But where can we connect more with your writing, you know, the original story and, and the things you're doing now? Um, well, I have a sub stack that's free. You can subscribe to uh, hey, okay. Good. <laughs> Daniela Terry at substack.com. Thank you very much. I think someday I want to go on an eating tour, you know, okay, to Italy. Uh, that's a different podcast on a different day. So yeah. everyone, Danielle writes about a lot of things, including uh, Bronte's novels and did a whole food tour around that. So anyway, thank right. you so thank much. You. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.